Kate Chadbourne is in the house, and she comes from Lunenburg, Massachusetts. She is uh, highly sought after as a singer, a singer, songwriter, a storyteller, a poet. She plays the harp, flutes, piano. She um, holds a PhD in Celtic languages and literatures and has taught courses in Irish language and folklore. Um, and uh, she is especially uh, busy in the month of March uh, with uh, everyone's uh, interest in celebrating St. Patrick's. Um, but uh, she actually goes back and does a lot of celebrating in February uh, when she hosts a gathering of friends uh, of great talent who are poets, storytellers, uh, songwriters. And uh, so she's bringing a sample of that this morning to share with us uh, one month later. So uh, happy that we could get Kate to come in her busy month. Um, a little more about Kate is that uh, her own music has been on NPR programs, uh, Car Talk and All, All Songs Considered. Okay. She has a few CDs out there, perhaps they're there today as well as her other features. Her Irishy Girl has been played in Irish programs throughout the country and she has a collection of poetry about her father, a Maine lobsterman, which won the Kalupi Press uh, chapbook contest. When I asked Kate about a favorite moment sharing herself. She also went back to Ireland like Terence and Mary and said, being invited to sing by uh, Donegal fiddler James Byrne was one of the most deeply affirming and inclusive occasions of my life. In his presence, music was an art form of connection and respect. When he played a slow air or when he asked me to sing, the whole room dropped into reverential quiet. And at the end of the of the air or the song, there was a sense that we had traveled somewhere together, that something important had happened. And today she is here and she has invited her friends, Dorian Brooks, Susan Lloyd McGarry, and Nancy Baudet. And they'll be joining us and very happy that they're all here. And uh, when I asked Kate to tell a little bit about this process of uh, honoring St. Bridget of Ireland, uh, Kate said that when this happens once a year, the sharing, sharing of the art that rises out of real feelings and experiences in a Bridget circle makes us feel more connected to each other and also, I think, more truly ourselves. I am always amazed by the honesty and the courage of what emerges and I feel strengthened in my own commitment to live honestly and courageously. And so now I would like to introduce Kate Chadbourne, who will introduce to you the rest of the Bridget Circle for this morning. So please give a round, warm of applause to the Bridget Circle and Kate Chadbourne. Well, I'd love to introduce these are my great friends. Mm -hmm. On the end, poet Susan Lloyd McGarry. <laughs> Next to her, Dorian Brooks, po a poet, wonderful poet, also Irish speakers, I should say lovely Irish speakers, and my dear friend here, Nancy Baudet, singer-songwriter and um, musician. So we're all together. So I've asked Dorian if she would read a poem for us. Oh, is okay? You can, you know what, if you want, you can stand up, you can sit down, you can dance, you can... <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Um, I'll read this poem that I wrote to Bridget, and it is called To Bridget. <laughs> it has as an epigraph, Bridget is the ancient Celtic goddess of healing, smithcraft, and poetry associated with fire and sacred wells. Mm. In the harsh, metallic winter, when I tried to sing, my tongue stuck in ashen air, my voice died. When I tried to breathe, my heart stalled. Cold mists corroded my sleep. Now you come, rinsing the land in buttery light, touching the willows with your wand. My body stirs. I wake to the cry of newborn lambs. My song flares in your footsteps like wind flowers. Bridget, I am water, swirled in a dish to catch your eye. Dance with me. I am the earth opening to your fire. Hold me. Heal me. Oh, I love that door. I 
love that that this ancient goddess and even this maybe fifth century saint is still <laughs> inspiring works of art now. It's beautiful. Thank you. Well, Nancy, would you like to sing us a song? I would love to, and I would love it if everyone sang along. This is a uh, song that I wrote with my great friend uh, Christine Hatch um, in honor of Bridget called Bless All These Things. There's a chorus here that I think um, would be nice for all of you to join in with. Try that, please. For loving, for living, for laughing, for giving, Bridget, bless all these things. Bridget, bless all these things. For speaking, for thinking, for our joyful singing, for speaking, for Susan's Irish name. Yeah, yeah. I, I just before I, I I'm going to say a little poem, but um, to say "Damo arigato" uh, for the woman who sang at the beginning and mm. the thoughts of uh, the Japanese affected by the earthquake, which is also an island, as Ireland <laughs> is Indeed. an island. Uh, and to and to wish, you know, a, a Bridget Circle like the cloak isn't bounded. That's right. <laughs> That's why we're this way, actually, you know? So we can think of this circle extending all the way there and bringing her healing qualities. Because one of the stories of Bridget 
uh, is about her not only about her cloak in terms of uh, claiming land, but mm -hmm. also that her cloak has other magical properties that it that it heals. And on um, Saint Bridget's Eve, if you put out a piece of cloth out on the hedgerow uh, to catch the morning dew, it can magically extend, and it has healing properties for the rest of the world. So. Um, Send ending those healing properties out, out to Japan. Yeah. Yeah. And just the poem I'm going to read is called Nourishment, which just seems to me such a part of, of Bridget. Uh, yeah. And you can imagine, and I talk a little bit about brown bread, which is this delicious mm. kind of staple food in Ireland, and you can imagine it slathered in butter um, oh, yeah, for, <laughs> for this <laughs> purpose. Uh, and I also talk about the daughter of Bui, and um, Bui is, you know, like a pre-goddess goddess who sometimes is thought as the precursor of Bridget, so that's just that kind of unfamiliar name. And something else mentioned in here is the burren, which is this incredible rocky but fertile landscape in County Clare, so just nourishment. Yesterday, this bread was baked by Mrs. Mary Callahan, my landlady, and wrapped to take and eat as I traveled away at dawn from the village of the daughter of Bui mm. and her healing well, away from the rock and green. Two days ago, I walked the burren with a friend, talking about our lives, about his children. I taste the time we had together and all the days we won't. I want more than I can have. Sometimes I stride through the rubble of my life, and sometimes I step carefully, as I did then. This evening, I savor the rich, dark bread, the rough grain on my tongue. Well, as I told you, Bridget, you know, she had this lifelong love of cows and uh, she's, and everything that we've just been saying, you know, if you want to have a cup of tea and a good slice of brown bread slathered in butter, Bridget is your girl, you know, and uh, all these beautiful things, the primroses in Nancy's song, um, this is a, a plurine schnachte, a snowdrop, Dorian gave me this brooch, and that is one of Bridget's flowers, so she's just connected to all, to life, really, I think that's why... I like her so much. I think of her as a friend. Well, she was heroic in her way, and uh, she loved especially all the creatures of the world. And uh, one day, she used to go riding in her chariot. I, I love to think of, the, of this early Irish saint in her chariot, thundering across the plains of Ireland. Yaw! And I, I love to say that she was like Xena, warrior princess. You know, here's Bridget, like, no little sissy saint. You know, she's like... Pardon me, but a badass saint. Woo! And there she is, thundering across Ireland in her chariot. And she sees, as she's going, dun, 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 she sees a little family over in the woods. And they're all <laughs> crying. And, uh, and she pulls over and goes over to them. That's the break, you know. And, and says, what seems to be the trouble here, you know? And they say, our father, oh my God. She says, slow down, tell me the story. It's our father. He used the king's forester and ah, he killed the king's pet fox. Oh, it was an accident. Well, they told her he was a forester and he saw this little fox near their chickens and he thought it was going to eat the chickens and he took the ax and oh, no is right. Well, it was very sad and they said, the king has our father and he's going to kill him. She said, just leave it to me. I'll solve everything. As I told you, she did with Mary, right? She can solve anything. <laughs> so she got back into the chariot. Yaw, yaw. And this time <laughs> she went across the plains and she was doing this. Well, I hope that doesn't screw up the microphone. But anyway, because that's a magical whistle, as you know. And she's looking left and she's looking right, never been easy for me, and she, and finally there in the corner of the field she sees these two little red ears and these two bright shining eyes and 
this little fox comes running out of the woods and it jumps up into her cloak and it snuggles here and she pushes him down into her cloak. It's just heavenly to have a little fox right there. <laughs> and she goes riding into the king's castle because that's what they used to do. They just drive their chariots right in. And she gets inside and the king is in a wrath and he's saying, I'm going to kill that stupid woodcutter. He killed my baby fox. It was the most precious fox in the world. I loved him more than my children. <laughs> kill the woodcutter. And she said, just a minute there, king, just a minute. Look, I've got something. And she opened her cloak and out came the beautiful little fox. And the king looked at him, he said, that's just a regular fox, he's nothing special, I miss my foxy loxy. <laughs> well, she said, just a minute, watch this king. And she clapped her hands. And the king sat up on his back legs, and he danced around. <laughs> <laughs> and she... Not the king. <laughs> the fox, well, I wish the king had, but no. <laughs> he wasn't really that kind of a man, but anyway. <laughs> He danced around, he said, well, that's good, but it's nowhere near as good as my foxy locks. He was the smartest fox that ever lived. She said, just a minute, watch this king. She clapped her hands and she said, foxy, what's one plus one? And the fox, whoa, that was emphatic. Yes, because he knew that one, it was two. Yeah, the king said, well, that's pretty good, but that's not even hard. I could do that one. She said, okay. <laughs> How about this? What's two plus two? Well, yeah, that's also very good. That's right, right? Yes, that's right. Right, well, that's not hard. Do a hard one. She said, all right, Foxy, what's three plus four? That was right. He had to consult with the official mathematician. Yeah, that was right, yes. Very good. The, the, he's been verified. It was very good. But still, he's not as good as my fox. And she said, just one more thing. And she clapped her hands. And the fox leapt up into the king's arms. And he began to lick his beard. Oh, <laughs> oh I love this fox. Oh, no, no, no. I love the fox. <laughs> I must have this fox. I love him. Take the woodcutter. I don't care. Just take him away. I don't mind. Well, she said, all right, okay, Foxy, you have to stay here with the king. And because I told you every animal loved Bridget, he looked out. Oh, it's a sacrifice, you know, but sure enough, he did it for Bridget. And she took the woodcutter back to the people, and they were delighted to have him. That king loved the fox. He loved him so much. It was just so dear to him for about two weeks. Because that's the way boys and toys know that's the way kings can be and uh, at the end of about two weeks he he began to get restless he said you know I think we should go to war what do you think man and all the men said yes yes king that's a great I, I, I think war is a good idea let's let's go to war who should we go to war on you know then they had to think about that who they might actually attack but it was a good idea to go to war and so they got all their men and all the horses and all the banners and all the arms and everything all the instruments of war and they began to march out out to war, out to war, this is great fun. And the fox sat on the throne, watching, 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 as all the men walked off to war. And when the little fox saw the coast was clear, he ran, ran, ran out of the castle, out of the kingdom, and ran, ran, ran all the way to Kildare, where he found Bridget, and he leapt up into her cloak, and he snuggled down, and he never left her all the rest of his life. That's my story if there's a lion at Soviet. <laughs> Thank you very much. The walkers. Three women from this quiet circle set out at dusk on summer nights to walk off extra weight. They leave husbands wandering through the half-empty houses. Children stop play to call after them. Large in the western sky, Venus shines. They walk faster, gaining the end of the street. The scent of a flowering shrub drifts from an unfamiliar yard. They pause at the lighted windows as though watching home movies. Startled by a blowing shadow, they hesitate, join arms and run, relishing their fear, and come to rest against 
the tilted stones of the old cemetery. They trace the epitaphs, beloved wife, still faithful husband, by her side, and they laugh. They wade in the black water at the landing, recalling when they tried to walk the yellow pathway before them to the moon. The tips of weeds gleam at the surface. Above, the darkness spreads, clouds cover, all but that one planet. The street leading home is puddled with light, trees crowding either side, branches nearly meeting over their heads. They move closer, conversation lags, and they walk through. This is called Italian Bees, and the epigraph, 1859, the first were imported to America. It has many excellent qualities. Its tongue is long. It is not unpleasantly aggressive. And that's from the ABC and XYZ of bee culture by Root. They dance the hornpipe through my neighbor's garden in striped jerseys, body sailors on shore leave, lasciviously kissing the deep-throated blossoms. My neighbor holds their queen for ransom, pirates their gold, the plot turns seedier. They crown a virgin queen and swarm over the fields, plundering peaceful hives. I discover a subversive humming in my kitchen, sipping at my jam. It, nu it nuzzles my face, neck, arms. I hold open the door for it to leave, my cheeks burning. And one short one, finally, called hens. The chickens a neighbor sends for my freezer are alive in a sack. The boys, nervous debutantes, borrow an ax. Through the window, I see hens dancing headless on the snow. A tub of bloody water, wet feathers. They're delivered up naked, pimpled with quills. I scoop out the grainy crop, yolks swimming in the body's cavity. Intestines break, steam the kitchen. We boil, bake them, but those tough-skinned ladies slide over the plates, skitter through the rice, never give in. Mm. I am dead as 
instead I will maybe I hope you'll find the place where I am lying and you will kneel and sing an ave there for me and I will hear those soft you tread above me and all my grave shall warmer sweeter be if you sleep in peace until you come to me.